Hi, everyone. Well, I want to welcome you to tonight's uh, discussion um, about the Green New Deal. My name is Judy Como Hart. I'm a resident of Ohio City and have been for the last 17 years. So I want to give you a little bit of background of how, about uh, how we put all of this together. Um, I am um, a uh, nonprofit executive and have worked for the last 30 years in the nonprofit community, working on a number of causes. And I retired about three years ago, actually it's two years ago, uh, and just decided that I was going to take some time to read and, and um, pursue some things that I had been interested in. And one of them is this whole topic of climate change. And I, um, um, so I started reading some books on climate change. Uh, one is a book called um, Climate Change, What Everyone Needs to Know by Joseph Rome. And what I read alarmed me. So I read another book called uh, Climate of Hope, which is a more hopeful book by um, Michael Bloomberg and Carl Polk, the former executive director, the national director of the Sierra Club. And then I became um, more interested and I started talking to a lot of local organizations, uh, including the city of Cleveland and their, their department on sustainability, as well as the county department on sustainability, the Sierra Club and a number of other organizations. And I decided that really, we should have some community discussions about climate change in Ohio City. So I approached Ohio City Inc. to see if they would be uh, willing to be a co-sponsor. And then I approached the community of St. Peter, which is my faith community, and uh, which had expressed an interest in climate change. So uh, here we are. Um, this is one of a, what we hope to be a four or five part series on climate change with the first discussion on the Green New Deal. So Whitney, you wanna take it from here? Absolutely, thank you, Judy. So Judy said, my name is Whitney Long Jones. I am the organizing and engagement manager at Ohio City Incorporated. And Judy has really taken the lead on sharing her passion with us and bringing us all together so that this event can be possible. So thank you, Judy. And um, I think you wanted to thank our sponsors as well. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. No, just go ahead. I think we're really grateful to the community of St. Peter mm -hmm. and to Ohio City mm -hmm. for sponsoring this event. Awesome. So um, Ohio City Inc. is a nonprofit community development corporation based in Ohio City on the near west side of Cleveland. And my role is to work as best as possible with engaging the residents of Ohio City, uh, connecting them to resources, encouraging them to put on resident-led programs, um, identifying opportunities so that the community is as interactive with each other and other stakeholders as possible, including small local businesses, our social, social service agencies. And uh, some of the things that Ohio City Inc. has been working on recently is developing a racial equity policy to uh, outline all of the work that we're doing. So the whole purpose is to, again, just make sure that we are equitably engaging as many people as possible so that folks have a voice, have a seat at the table, and have access to resources that some of the populations have historically been excluded from. So um, what you'll learn tonight is very interesting. We have a, a passionate panel who is gonna share what it is that they're working on, information on the Green New Deal, and how we can become more involved. So before we get to that, I wanna throw a couple of housekeeping items out there. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add that to the Q&A box. You know, avoid the chat. We can use that for discussion, but if there's questions for us, for the panelists, please put that in the Q&A box. And we will get to that at the very end of the presentation. And also, please stay tuned for the entire presentation because we will give be giving away five books to um, attendees, randomly selected attendees. Winning the Green New Deal is the book that 
Judy has shared with us, has shared with me, that has inspired her to put this event on. So I will pass it over to our panelists and get into the presentation. Enjoy, everybody. Okay, thank you so much, Whitney. Yeah, so my name is Dan. I'm, I'm an Oberlin College student, and um, I will be one of the panelists, and I'm gonna pass it over to Robert, who's going to introduce himself. Hey everyone, thanks for coming. I'm grateful to be here. My name is Robert Rice. I am Black Tapone, Tuscarora, Catawba, and uh, of the Bear Clan. I'm an anthropology and history major, currently at Tri-C, but I'll be transferring to Cleveland State University soon. And I currently work as an AutoCAD technician. And now I will pass it to Troy. Everyone, my name is Troy DeSorath. I am a junior um, in the James Madison College at Michigan State University where I uh, study both social relations and policy and comparative cultures and politics um, with a minor in science, technology, environment, and public policy. Um, so thank you all so much for coming out tonight. This is really a great honor. Um, I will kick it back over to Dan. Cool. So uh, just to go over kind of uh, the agenda um, of what uh, the three of us will be talking about tonight. So first, uh, we're just gonna talk about um, some of the problems that the Green New Deal uh, seeks to address. And uh, like, um, like some of our uh, the movement of predecessors that have generated uh, many of the ideas of the Green New Deal. Uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, the actual like policies that we're talking about uh, with the Green New Deal. So like what kind of programs are included in that and then kind of like the path ahead for it and how we can make it a reality. Um, so just some more um, information about uh, myself and other panelists. So the, I'm from Michigan originally, uh, but I've uh, had the honor of meeting a lot of cool people in the Northeast Ohio area since I've been here, which has been great. Um, I've uh, been uh, highly involved in like political organizing over the last four or five years. And I've always known that climate change was like probably like the number one issue that was gonna be affecting uh, my life and, the, and like millions of lives around the, uh, like around the country and the world. But I um, always kind of was afraid of the issue and I never wanted to think about it or like do any like, reading about it or like engage with it at all because it was just so scary and I really didn't see a path out of it. I had no vision of what could happen that we could do to address it and I just didn't see that happening. And so that kind of changed when I first learned about the Green New Deal. And that's when I uh, like, first started to have like some hope that we could uh, like do something to address it and actually like build a better world um, in the process. So I've been uh, like very involved in that for probably like two years since I joined uh, the Sunrise Movement uh, which all three of us are a part of. So I helped to found uh, Sunrise Oberlin, which is the Oberlin uh, chapter, which I'm still involved in. Yeah, so I'm gonna pass it off to Robert. Hey everyone. Yeah, so for myself, I was been born and raised in Cleveland to be specific, uh, technically Shaker Heights. And I guess for me, I've always kind of had a an, an awareness. I, an awareness in political and social uh, issues over time. And I largely attribute that back to my grandmother. She was a storyteller and teacher. So she kind of molded me as I grew up. And then as I got into the high school, I feel like I kind of strayed away from certain teachings and maybe um, affiliate myself with like the wrong influences and crowds. But then that, you know, ironically, I started um, different circles, started listening to like punk rock music and and reading more about political and social history and theory and like just understanding what was going on in the world around me and like really trying to plug myself into that and of course you know the environmental issue the environmental crisis for me was at the forefront of that because that's such an you know an existential um crisis that is this for all people, especially people on the front line, indigenous and PLC. So that really encouraged me to get involved with that as well. You know, from next gen climate to sunrise, I even had experience being out at Standing Rock for a few days, just specifically Mandan outside of Standing Rock to help um, their legal collective out there. So just different things that I, I tried to really, you know, work on and strive towards and support, including the Green New Deal. And with that, I'll pass it to Troy. Sorry, I was stuck on mute. Thanks, Robert. Um, yeah, I'm really grateful to have been invited to speak at an event like this, not only because I get the opportunity to tell each of you how you can join this momentous fight, um, but because it really gave me the opportunity to reflect on why I did. 
As I sat down to write these remarks, though, I found myself really struggling with that question. Yes, a year and a half, a year and a half ago, in a moment of equal parts moral anxiety and outrage about something the current occupant of the White House had done, I signed up online to create a hub of the Sunrise Movement at Michigan State. However, I've come to realize that there was something much more profound behind that decision, something that explain, explains what seems like an otherwise impulsive choice on its face. In fact, something fundamental about my upbringing led me to take action that day. I grew up in St. Clair, Michigan, a working class town with almost exclusively white residents, to two public school teachers who seemed to be the only people interested in talking about social justice. They taught me about the history of privilege given to someone who looks, loves, and prays like I do, and how this privilege is anathema to the inherent dignity and equality of all people. Throughout my childhood, this conception of the structures of power was proven right time and time again. Tens of thousands of innocent Iraqi civilians were killed in an unjust and fraudulent war. Millions of Americans, including members of my own family, lost their jobs or their savings or even their homes due to the greed and recklessness of the banking class. An entire city in Michigan was poisoned by its state in the name of fiscal responsibility. All of these tragedies were linked by a singular moral failing that those least responsible for devastation and destruction were forced to bear their greatest burdens. Looking back, I now understand that it was my realization of this fundamental quandary, now at risk of playing out on, on a global scale in the climate crisis, that brought me into this fight. So thank you all once again for being here, and I will uh, pass it over to Robert to get us into the presentation. All right. So I think it's important to understand, you know, like the trajectory of where we're coming from to where we are today to understand the next important steps that need to be taken, which, you know, includes the Green New Deal. But um, as of recently, you had the 2018 UN report from the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change, which gave out information about um, the uh, upcoming calamities and the issues that we have with like in consideration to the carbon budget which is basically studies have shown that we have this amount of time, 10 years to be specific, until um, we uh, reach an area of irreversible damage. So um, we need to have you know, an increasing environmental changes and reform to prevent such a thing, to prevent going up 1.5 degrees Celsius. So again, we'll be able, you know, just through re renewable energy, and then next slide, how we got here. So looking back, at, le at least going back to the seventies and eighties, we see this growing um, pressure towards like an unbridled, unfettered um, capitalism. Some refer to it as ne neoliberalism. Um, you can look at people such as Margaret Thatcher, or Ronald Reagan. And basically again, what that was was just like this acceleration of profits and deregulation and unfortunately, not only did that lead to issues abroad with um, military conflicts, but even on a um, domestic and global scale, we we're seeing, you know, environmental issues as well, specifically environmental justice issues, environmental racism issues. And you could just look at Flint, as was mentioned before. Standing Rock is another great example of environmental racism, right? Because during that time, with the Dakota Access Pipeline, they had initially, initially had planned to take it through Bismarck, but with it being a mostly white community, they said, we don't want to deal with whatever sort of flack we may get from doing that. So they chose to go through the Standing Rock Lakota territory. So that's just another example of environmental racism. And, and even with that understanding of of the, the harm that was being caused to not only the environment at a large, but different communities, um, um, organizations and corporations such as Exxon, they even knew, they knew as of 1977, um, the harm that was being perpetrated. Yet they still lobbied to continue for that sort of unfettered capitalism and spreading like a misinformation campaign, which is comparable to the tobacco industry as well. Next slide. And in response to that, there was a growing environmental justice movement. You know, during the time in the 1970s, the environmental justice movement was largely, mainly to be honest, a white, um, more elite kind of um, movement. And you had lobbyists and organizations such as that. But by the 80s, 
just started to be a reaction towards that, mainly black and indigenous led, especially by women. And there was people standing up and, and making a more of a grassroots effort saying like, hey, you know, we have to go beyond just conservation fights or fighting because you want to save a beautiful park or something like that. Like there are people, human beings are being harmed by this every single day, not just in Flint and Standing Rock, but you can look at um, the, uh, I believe the Love Canal in Niagara, issues in Los Angeles, New York City. So different organizations throughout the country had, um, had, had kind of organized on the ground level to say like, hey, you know, this is affecting us on an everyday basis as well. And I think the important thing to take away from that is, you know, for decades, there's been so much bickering on all sides of the aisle about, you know, what the scientific data says, what the numbers say, what the statistics say. And don't get me wrong, that's important, but what's equally, if not more important, is listening to the communities who are being harmed by it every single day while people are having a tit for tat for which number is this, which number is that, you know, there's people being harmed every day. And then with that, I will pass it on to uh, Troy. Thanks so much, Robert. Um, yeah, so after that intro, now we're gonna get into the Green New Deal itself. Um, you know, a lot is made of it, but really it's only a 14 page resolution. Um, and resolution's the key word there. Um, it's not legislation. It is not ready to go um, and be enacted tomorrow. Um, the grand vision for it is that it will um, be implemented in multiple pieces of comprehensive legislation over the course of the next de decade called the Decade of the Green New Deal. Um, the first one of those pieces of legislation called the Green New Deal for Public Housing is already out and is a plan to retrofit buildings and such, which Dan will get into later. But for now, the Green New Deal that you need to know is that it's a 14 page resolution, which is just um, a, a proposed set of steps taken to kind of guide the, the priorities of our federal government over the next 10 years. Um, and fundamentally, this resolution boils down to two very straightforward parts. First, what needs to be done? Um, here are all the solutions that you typically associate with climate policy, um, that you would typically associate with getting um, our carbon budget under control. You know, solar panels, wind turbines, um, a, a shift to electric vehicles, um, and that's all really important. But what makes the Green New Deal um, unique um, to any climate plan that's ever been put forward is the second half. Because secondly, it asks, how will we make this transition of energy systems justly? Um, because in every example of a time of massive economic upheaval that we have in world history, um, working people have really been left on the cutting room floor. Um, you know. Before the Industrial Revolution and after, the same, the same people were wealthy, both before and after the Industrial Revolution. And quite frankly, with the current coronavirus crisis, we're seeing the same thing right now. Um, the, the billionaires in our country, including Jeff Bezos, are racking in hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions more. Um, Bezos is now on a path to be the first trillionaire in world history by 2022, while a great deal of our society is left without healthcare, without a steady income. Um, so the second half of this plan is, is a set of promises to working people that says, we are not, not gonna leave you behind as we make this shift because this crisis is not your fault and we're gonna have your back. So um, speaking of, of making these promises to workers, um, this whole plan is of course inspired by the original New Deal, which was um, signed into law by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who's pictured here. Um, but it's important to note um, that no president takes these types of actions on their own. Uh, FDR was pushed over the course of years by a labor movement of hundreds of thousands of people um, who wanted just working conditions and a, and a form of a, a safety net to, to pick people up when they fell down. Um, and, and they did win huge wins, you know, despite massive gains like social security and unemployment insurance and banking reform. Um, even with those huge wins, they were still unable to achieve what FDR called his second bill of rights, which are also pictured on the right there. Um, 
the logic underpinning this is that since our nation's founding, um, white propertied men, at least, um, and later, you know, freedoms have been expanded. But at the beginning, that group of people was guaranteed political and civil rights, which was unique um, in world history. However, over the course of generations um, of, of unregulated capitalism, unbridled capitalism, the people that have more when they are born, time and time again, have more the, the entire length of their life. And, and if you don't regulate capitalism to some extent, the, the chance for social mobility disappears. And so the second Bill of Rights is just an idea that we have um, not only political and civil rights, but we're entitled to economic rights as well, like those listed there, you know, to a job with a decent wage, to health care, to housing, and, and to a dignified retirement and, and education. So um, this, this second Bill of Rights, realizing this second Bill of Rights is, is a crucial part of the Green New Deal to realize what the, the original New Deal couldn't achieve. Um, and speaking of things the original, original New Deal couldn't achieve, um, or I, I shouldn't say couldn't, um, specifically chose not to achieve, was um, the programs that were put in place at that time, the GI Bill, Social Security, Unemployment Insurance, they were all race neutral on their face. Um, there was no word it, wording in the legislation that said that African Americans or other people of color um, could be excluded but it was unequal in how it was implemented. So the, the Jim Crow Democrats of the South from that time controlled a lot of the committee chairmanships in Congress. And what they did is they appropriated all of this federal money and sent it to the states, but they told the states, you can spend this however you would like to, knowing full well that the Jim Crow states were going to keep those monies keep those dollars from African Americans, indigenous folks, and other people of color. Um, and, you know, they allowed private institutions like banks and colleges to dis discriminate. There was no language in the bill ex uh, explicitly prohibiting them from doing that. And another big, another big aspect was that um, they excluded certain types of jobs from being able to collect social security. So at first, um, farm workers, predominantly consisting of African-American men were excluded and domestic maids predominantly consisting of African-American women were excluded. And so in this way, the original New Deal was racialized in its implementation. So consequently, um, our project with the Green New Deal is first and foremost to repair this deep racial harm. We had affirmative action for white people for generations. You know, a lot of people probably on this call had relatives benefit from the GI Bill, um, from Social Security to this day. Um, this plan is meant to repair the damage done by all of the families who were excluded. You know, that, um, that is the foremost kind of moral principle of the Green New Deal. And it, it, it does this through um, advancing projects like Medicare for All, which will disproportionately benefit working class, Black, and Latinx folks. Um, and it also invests money in wetlands restoration that would rely upon indigenous knowledge and directly benefit the tribes that have been really responsible stewards of the land for millennia. That's the reparative justice aspect of this plan. But as I mentioned before, it's also crucial that we protect workers and frontline communities during this, this time of upheaval. Um, it's just a matter of fact that there are going to be some jobs that will no longer, that exist now that will no longer exist in a green energy economy. So what we do is we make clear to the coal miners in Appalachia um, that in, in, in other people in, in similarly extractive industries that our fight is not with you. Our fight is with the CEO that's, that's been sending, you know, your father and your grandfather and you into a mine to get black lung and then probably not even pay your pension on the back end. Um, our fight is with corporate greed. Um, we are going to protect you through programs like paid job retraining, healthcare, um, universal job guarantees when you finish that training. 
um, because it's not your fault, the coal miner in Appalachia, it's not the fault of the residents of California right now who are waking up and seeing the sun covered with smoke at 8.30 a.m. It's not the fault of, of you know, uh, Latinx people in Miami who live in public housing that's already being flooded on sunny days. Um, it's not any of their fault. And there's a, a, a place for every worker in um, a renewable energy future. And then lastly, the Green New Deal is truly a plan to protect representative democracy as we know it. Um, there's, there's a lot of political science research on this topic. Um, most famously, a 2013 report from researchers at MIT, Harvard, and Columbia that talks about the disease of inequality, that when um, too few people in a society collect a, in, an inordinately high percentage of the wealth um, and a great deal of, of this society is left out entirely um, of economic security. We're not talking about everyone having the same amount, but everyone at least having a modicum of security. Um, when, when a society gets to that point, it leads to, to democracy tumbling down. People start blaming immigrants and, and people that don't look like themselves um, for the problems of a really, really small minority of the population hoarding a lot of wealth and keeping the other people out of, out of the, you know, blessings of full citizenship. You know, I don't think anyone on this call thinks it's, it's right that the three wealthiest people in America own as much wealth as the bottom half. That's 165 million people. Um, I don't think anyone on this call thinks that it's okay that um, 40 percent of all families in the United States could not afford a $400 expense that was unexpected without going into um, debt. You know, I don't think anyone on this call wants a society that, that is that unequal and it really leads to a disease um, in our democracy and so this is a plan to fix it. Um, and now that we've talked about the moral vision of the Green New Deal a bit, I will kick it over to Dan to talk more about the policy. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for that, Troy. So uh, like Troy mentioned, the Green New Deal was first introduced as a congressional resolution with uh, five goals and 14 uh, projects. So the five goals were uh, to get off of fossil fuels as much as possible within 10 years, uh, to create uh, millions of good paying jobs in the process, uh, to build the infrastructure necessary for a green economy, uh, to secure clean air and water for all, and to combat social inequalities. Uh, and then there's also uh, 14 like industrial projects, which are part of the Green New Deal, which we'll talk about soon. Um, so like since that was introduced uh, like close to uh, the two years ago now, um, it kind of opened up a big national um, conversation, like top to bottom with uh, the policymakers, uh, campaigns, um, to like grassroots, a like community, um, yeah, sorry, the community groups can't talk today and uh, participants in Green New Deal uh, town halls, which uh, Sunrise held last year and lots of other groups um, um, held as well. So um, I think in the past like two or three months, there's actually starting to be like a consensus among environmental groups, uh, uh, also like among uh, many like labor unions uh, and social justice based groups on kind of a more uh, comprehensive and detailed uh, policy framework for like how we can achieve these goals of the Green New Deal. And um, it's based on a uh, like three-pronged approach called standards, investments, and justice, which we will go through. And uh, these are really like drawing upon uh, like lots of the ideas of like the environmental justice movement as Robert was talking about too. Um, so like the core of the Green New Deal is these investments. So it's kind of like the original um, like New Deal where the government uh, hires people like to do these projects, which they think are socially beneficial. So one main thing that we have to do is make sure that we get um, our like electricity from a green source instead of from coal and natural gas. So that uh, requires building a huge capacity of, um, of, of the wind and solar power mostly. So uh, the wind and solar are what's called uh, counter cyclical. So uh, at times when there's more sun, there's less wind, which is like winter and summer. Yeah, so uh, so you can mostly make a grid that's based on just these two sources, but you would also have to invest a lot 
in um, energy storage, which is another big project that we have to do, and retool uh, like the physical grid, which was built to accommodate uh, fossil fuels and is not very resilient to extreme weather events, which will grow more common as climate change worsens. So uh, lots of these are projects that we like should do like anyways, right? Um, yeah, so in terms of uh, transportation, there's a lot of investments that have to be made uh, there too. One is to scale up um, the electric car um, industry uh, because we have to phase out uh, gasoline cars. And that also means uh, building uh, charging stations across the country uh, so that it's like convenient to uh, drive them and to make sure that they're affordable for people because right now they're not. Uh, but we also have to invest in systems of transportation that uh, move away from just using cars so, uh, so like cities need the funds to produce uh, much more robust and accessible systems of public transportation. And then we also have to build a high speed rail network across the country. So that's um, like something that lots of countries have actually already done. It's like my favorite aspect of this is that uh, we can end up with a, a great uh, like system of electric uh, trains across the country. So this is like, if you're trying to go from like Chicago to New York or something, like now you would have to drive the whole way which is pretty expensive and uses fossil fuels and like actually not very safe and kind of a hassle. Um, or you, you could fly, which kind of has all the same problems. So like you could just take an electric train, which should be very affordable and great. So that's like a cool aspect of this. Um, and also uh, we need to retrofit uh, millions of buildings across the country, which are, uh, which use natural gas heating. So we would have to like electrify those buildings. And uh, there are, um, like 10 more projects as well, which are not like the core three. Uh, so those include um, investing in retrofitting industrial facilities, which are powered by fossil fuels and electrify them, uh, restoring uh, forests, wetlands, and mangroves across the country, which are carbon sinks. So those uh, like are ways like, to actually like, absorb uh, carbon dioxide emissions and a few more as well. So uh, as we build the green economy, which I talked about, uh, we also have to uh, phase out the fossil fuel economy, which is what standards are. So um, you've probably heard of standards in a few different contexts. So one is a lot of states and localities have what they call um, a renewable energy portfolio. So that's where there's a minimum requirement for uh, how much of like the electric utility power is coming from like, a renewable source. So there's been big, like, big fights about that in the state of Ohio and other places. Um, so, so probably the most like straightforward and direct way to uh, phase out uh, fossil fuels and make sure that the uh, make sure that uh, like it actually happens is to use standards and say, well, you have you actually have to go like a hundred percent by twenty thirty. So, uh, so like in terms of like electricity, uh, transportation, and buildings, so those are all uh, sectors of the, sectors of the economy where there's uh, the technology available to go uh, totally green. And that can be done uh, within uh, 10 years if we move fast enough. So that means uh, standards on utility companies that uh, mandate 100% clean energy by 2030. Um, in terms of uh, cars, those would be on the auto manufacturers and distributors, so car companies, uh, making it so they can't sell gasoline cars anymore after a certain date. And uh, lots of people are talking about kind of a, uh, like a cash for clunkers type program, which would allow people to trade in their old gasoline cars and get a clean one. Um, and then buildings would be on uh, building companies to make sure that all new buildings are run on um, electricity, which would be green. So, uh, so, so like these standards and investments kind of like go together. It's like you build up the green economy and then you phase out the fossil fuel economy. Uh, there's a lot of ideas about uh, specifically how these investments are made. So, uh, like there are some like, advocates of like, building like a public power system. So one uh, program as part of the New Deal was uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority, which actually uh, provides power and still does for people who live in the um, who live in the uh, Tennessee Valley area. So like we could envision like a public power a program where these are just like public investments. Uh, there are going to be uh, some investments probably which are partnered with private firms. So like there's already private companies that sell uh, cars. So uh, like subsidies and investments in those like industries. And then there's a uh, there's also going to be some uh, like granting of funds to localities to build a public transportation systems. So these investments will happen in lots of ways, uh, but the standards will basically be like a federal standard that everybody has to follow. So the, uh, the final prong of this policy approach is uh, justice, which is very 
wide ranging and Troy cover like a lot of these, but basically in everything we do, uh, we have to make sure that everybody is taken care of and nobody's left behind is basically the bottom line. Um, so right now, one of the problems in the renewable energy uh, sector is that a lot of the jobs are not as good as fossil fuel jobs in terms of their compensation pay benefits. So one thing that you could do is have a stipulation in law that says like, hey, like if any company or city or anything like that is using uh, these federal funds uh, like for one of these green projects, uh, they have to ink a project labor agreement with labor unions or provide a uh, fair wage or benefits or something like that, uh, making sure that, that these jobs are going to be uh, good jobs. Um, there's also kind of a policy which has been adopted by lots of folks that you should channel 40% uh, of these investments into low-income communities. Um, so that's like making sure that uh, like low-income people and people of color who have been uh, usually kind of left behind of uh, these kinds of uh, government uh, programs are included. Um, so Troy had uh, mentioned like the GI Bill, which, which is like uh, left for folks that don't know. Um, like it's a bill which provides benefits for people who serve like in the armed services, um, including um, education benefits, uh, housing and healthcare. Um, so like this is like a model that the one can think about for uh, how to make sure that uh, fossil fuel workers who are displaced by the green transition um, are not uh, left behind. So I'm going to pass it over to Robert, who's going to talk um, about some more aspects of the Green New Deal and some critiques of it as well. Yeah, so as, essentially what the Green New Deal will achieve is kind of um, piggybacking just off of what Dan and Troy were saying is, you know, first and foremost, just um, fair fair wages, proper compensation for in that transition to re renewable energy jobs. And then also frontline justice, you know, implementing something such as the Green New Deal would prevent those flints, right? Those, those standing rocks, the communities in Niagara and Harlem and East LA, Cleveland even, where, the, where there's a uh, continual decades of history of them dumping toxic waste in and near um, communities, usually inner city communities, people of color, black and indigenous people. So really that's the main thing that the Green New Deal would achieve, but also taking it um, even deeper, there's an organization called the Red Nation who was founded within the past few years and this is an indigenous um, organization, polit social political organization. And one of the main focuses, of course, is on indigenous sovereignty and indigenous environmental stewardship. And in response to the Green New Deal, which they are, um, they look favorably towards, but they also expand upon it as well and have, have certain critiques, but it's mainly just an expansion upon the Green New Deal from an indigenous perspective. And mainly, looking from into more of a long-term sort of trajectory, it would like to see a society where we take it even further, even beyond the Green New Deal, where there's absolutely um, no fracking whatsoever, no, um, no nuclear usage, no nuclear energy usage. And then also a, um, yeah, no fracking, no nuclear usage, and also specifically, um, taken away from the profit um, mask assumption um, kind of cultural um, fabric of the society as well as the Green New Deal is still very much placates towards, you know, businesses and for-profit corporations and stuff like that. So the Red Deal is kind of crit critical of that as well. But so even I think possibly, if not more important is the larger picture as well. You know, a lot of times when we think of environmental issues, Clearly, first thing that's going to come to mind is the environment. But even outside of that, expanding from that, there's many other things that is affected by um, the disrespect of the earth and the environment. And one good example is um, the missing and murdered indigenous women issue, which is huge within Native communities. Native people, Native women in particular, have the highest rates of kidnappings and sexual assaults. And this largely occurs near. Um, um, oil man camps. A good example is North Dakota, where they had the big Bakken oil field booms. And in those places, they had set up man camps where the workers would come in and stay for extended periods of time. And a lot of times, these man camps are within a few miles of native um, territory and reservations. So unfortunately, because of that, 
a lot of predatory workers would go into native communities, ex exploit native people there, kidnap, again, sexual assault and stuff like that is rampant. So again, cutting back on that sort of disrespect towards the environment, the, um, the harm towards the environment and the jobs that it produces will also protect our women and children as well. And that's one of the things that the Red Deal tried to raise up as well as is giving that over comprehensive kind of understanding of what's at stake. And with that, I'll pass it back to Dan. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you very much. So uh, now we're just going to kind of talk about um, what the path ahead looks like for the Green New Deal. Like I know we've been talking about it um, and it sounds kind of like a big crazy thing, uh, but um, we have a thought about kind of like how to achieve it as well. So one thing that you have to understand when you talk about kind of climate politics is that most people actually uh, believe in climate change, they support uh, climate action, and all the policies of the Green New Deal are actually very popular. Um, so this is what you find in basically all public polling on the issue. And so uh, like what you have to like, understand is that uh, like just because a policy is popular uh, doesn't mean that it actually like is implemented. Right, so this is true of lots of policies which are very popular um, and then they're still stopped. And one reason like why that is, is not because the opposition is larger in numbers, but because they are more, uh, maybe because they're more like well-resourced or more, um, or more like coordinated or uh, well-connected. Um, so what we have with climate change is the fossil fuel lobby, which is a very powerful force in Washington and across politics, um, which has uh, been trying to basically uh, like stop any climate action as it comes up. So what we have to do is build a movement which is more coordinated and organized and um, which is supporting policies like as intensely as they're opposing it. Um, so one uh, like thing that Sunrise and other groups have tried to do is to pressure politicians into supporting many of the policies that we've talked about. And so over the past uh, two years, we, we have, We've actually been pretty, uh, like, like pretty like successful in doing that. So if you look at uh, the policies of a lot of folks who are, who are um, on the ballot this November, uh, they're much more ambitious, much more comprehensive than like anything you saw back in 2018 or 2016. So so that's definitely like a win. Uh, but one thing that we also know from history is that uh, like just because people like talk a big game on climate, it uh, really doesn't mean that they're going to follow through. So this kind of happened. Um, uh, like back in 09 and 2010 as well, when lots of folks uh, like were subbed into office on a climate change uh, platform, and then they uh, failed to deliver. So the big bill that was coming up uh, like during that time period was called Waxman-Markey, uh, which was a cap and trade bill, which somebody asked about in the comments, and I think we'll discuss a little, uh, a little more in depth afterward, probably. Uh, but uh, like a few things that were kind of like notable about this bill. Uh, one is that like it was like strictly a climate bill and it did not like seek to address um, economic issues or other issues that we talked about, uh, like kind of like pretending that changing like the energy source of the economy won't have other like ramifications on the society. Um, and two was that, uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, is that um, it was viewed by many as kind of a compromise bill, uh, like one that uh, like tried to appease the opposition um, and was like kind of like more, like, more um, incremental. So because of that, it kind of fractured its own uh, coalition. So like it wasn't able to appease uh, the fossil fuel lobby, which was still against it. And it kind of just um, uh, like fractured its own, um, its only like, base of support. So, so like environmental groups were not super into it because they thought it was kind of weak. Uh, social justice groups had major concerns about its impact on uh, communities of color. And uh, like trade unions were kind of concerned that it wasn't good for jobs. So it had like public support. Most people uh, supported it but the bill had no movement uh, behind it. So there's nobody marching in the streets for Wax and Markey, which is why it failed. So we're trying to uh, like not make a program which is kind of like, um, which is kind of like a half measure that's um, like trying to please like the opposition because we're actually trying to uh, phase out the fossil fuel um, industry, which they won't like either way. So we're trying to build a bill that has the strongest coalition of support as it can. and and have as strong a movement as it can behind it. So we call you to join the uh, climate justice movement uh, like in any way that you can. And that's what Troy is gonna talk about right now. Perfect, thanks, Dan. 
Um, yeah, so before, before we wrapped up the, the presentation component tonight and got into some questions from you all, um, we wanted to have some real next steps for you to take, um, specifically in your community in Ohio City, but I know there's people from, from outside too, so um, really wherever you're at. Um, and the first of those is that you can vote for climate champions in two weeks. Um, you know, we are exactly two weeks away from a very, very consequential election now. Every election um, for the rest of this decade will be really consequential to uh, getting a climate um, agenda through. But um, although we acknowledge that, you know, voting is not enough, we'll, we're going to need a decisive movement behind it. Voting in two weeks for someone that believes in human-made climate change and is willing to commit a lot of um, resources and, and political capital to it is very important. So make a plan that keeps you safe while you exercise your democratic right. Um, I believe in Ohio, um, if you're voting absentee, you can have that postmarked all the way up to November 2nd, the day before the election. And if you feel safe enough to go in person, um, you can vote from 6.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. So please, please, please do that because um, I'll speak for all the panelists here. Our generation is really depending on you being an ally right now. Um, secondly, you can educate yourself. Um, read books like the one that we'll be raffling off called Winning the Green New Deal, which is written um, and edited by um, the, the, the founder and executive director of the Sunrise Movement. Um, and, and also make an effort to read and subscribe to and maybe financially support um, independent non-corporate news sources like uh, Mother Jones and The Intercept because they're delivering news without any ulterior motive. Um, they're not you know, beholden to any type of corporate donor. They're not trying to um, get clicks just to get advertisers. They are really only beholden to grassroots donors that fund them and they're doing great work on the climate front. Thirdly, you can join the movement or be an ally. Um, look up your local Sunrise Movement Hub um, or Sierra Club chapter um, or another group and either start going to their hopefully online meetings um, right now or if that feels daunting to you or feels like too big of a commitment, um, just be an ally. Uh, you can support them financially um, through donations. You can um, make food for them, donate food. Um, because I know I was at a, a um, conference outside at a park in Lansing that was socially distanced this, this past weekend. And one of the reasons we were able to stay there all day and, and together in community talking about, you know, potential election scenarios and how we would respond was because we had food that had been provided through donations to, to, the, to the movement. So that's always a big help to us as well. If you, if you can't, um, participate directly. Um, a couple more. Fourthly, uh, prophetic promotion. It might sound simple, but talk to your friends, neighbors, coworkers, and and um, and loved ones about the Green New Deal. Um, there's a lot of disinformation out there about it that's been kind of funneled through um, a certain media ec ecosystem and and kind of gets out there. I mean, I just got a text um, from kind of a spam text from some campaign right before this saying that um, the Green New Deal was going to, you know, kill 750,000 jobs in Michigan. So don't vote for a certain uh, senatorial candidate. You know, there's a lot of a lot of real fear mongering language around the Green New Deal. So um, we hope that you've that we've armed you with some uh, means to kind of take that on tonight. So go out in your community and and start those conversations because that's that alone is really important. And then lastly, kind of going back to the um, red deal aspect that Robert was talking about um, at the end of, of his part, um, there's an idea called land back, um, which we're going to hopefully on the, the cheat sheet that we send out after this, we're going to include some, some links to or some information about. But um, essentially, if you're, if you're a privileged person um, who's acquired a great deal of land um, over the course of your life, please consider returning some of that land to the indigenous people who have been stewards of it, will be stewards of it, and, and still are stewards of it today, um, because that's a first step that we can take towards indigenous sovereignty and towards the future of respect for all people that we're really talking about tonight. So um, thank you all so much for listening to our presentation. I'm going to kick it back over to Whitney, who is going to help moderate um, our, our Q&A.
Wow. So much information. Good information, nonetheless. That was a great presentation, Troy, Dan, and Robert. Thank you so much. So we do have a couple of... Actually, let me throw one more thing out there. Troy, you were mentioning voting, and we know that sometimes transportation can be a reason why people don't go out to vote. So if you need a ride to the polls, there's a local initiative happening where they're um, taking folks to the Board of Elections to drop off your ballot, and they're also giving rides on Election Day. And there's a website you can visit to find out more information about that. It is VoterDriveClee.com. So everything we're discussing tonight will definitely provide in a follow-up email, so that way you have it written down, you have access to the links, and you can take some action um, when you are when you feel it's necessary to do. So we do have a couple questions in the Q&A. So let's start with the first one. Does the GND support carbon cap and trade or carbon tax? And whoever can answer that, please go ahead, jump right on it. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I can um, answer that. So first of all, thank you for the question. It's a very good question. Yeah, so, um, um, so like for those like who don't know maybe, so um, cap and trade and carbon tax are both kind of like policy ideas about how to move away from fossil fuels. So carbon tax means uh, like that the government would put a tax on the uh, emissions of carbon dioxide. So like if you have like a company which is like a fossil fuel company or like a company that uses fossil fuels, then you would pay a certain like dollar amount uh, the per ton of uh, CO2 that that you're responsible for like emitting into the atmosphere. So it's a tax on mostly like large corporations, not people. Uh, but uh, there are concerns that like it would raise gas prices and do like lots of things that like would put the burden on on, on like everyday people. And uh, cap and trade is um, a system where the government makes uh, companies like buy a permit like in order to emit uh, fossil fuels. And so they sell a certain number of permits and then the companies can buy them and then like trade them around as they want. Um, and then you like lower the number of permits until there's less or none. So, um, so like the Green New Deal is not like something that people have a lot of like consensus on, like although I talked about uh, like the parts like where there are, which basically was like the policy part of my, my a presentation. So these would basically be like complementary uh, the policies like to the federal standards. So standards is just the kind of like the most like surefire way to make sure that uh, fossil fuels are like phased out and like, any uh, carbon tax or cap and trade scheme would probably be like secondary to that. And like, if you have like a follow up, uh, then we can definitely like discuss it more too. Awesome. Thank you very much. So here is a second question. Do we have a Sunrise chapter in Northeast Ohio? Who, where, and thank you. Uh, Robert or Dan? Yeah, I was gonna say like Robert's part of one, so I'm gonna. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Yes, yeah, so this. <laughs> The few, um, to my, I just recently got involved with Sunrise, but to my knowledge, there's there's a, there's a few um, local Sunrise chapters. You got one here in Cleveland and Overland as well. And if there's if there's any, I'm, I'm sure there's probably more, but if there's any I'm missing, please please add to that. But um, I know you can you can find that on the website. You can find them on Facebook, Instagram, all throughout social media. There's ways to get involved and reach out. Yeah, it's, uh, I can't, yeah, I don't have any one specific hub in my mind right now, but I know the sheet that we're going to be sending out, um, I linked the Sierra Club chapters page and the Sunrise Hub uh, page, because I think it's as simple as going to sunrisemovement.org backslash hubs, and there will be a map there of, of where each hub is, and I think a leader's um, contact email or phone number for you to get in contact with them. Also, look, Maggie just sent in the chat a Sunrise Hub map. So yeah, like you can find like the Cleveland and Overland hubs on Facebook as well. Thank you, Maggie. And that's been uh, 
she put sunrisemovement.org for the website. And okay, we have another question. So I'm going to read this. Your criticism of capitalism seems to be evident in much of your talk. Do you believe a strategy with less criticism of capitalism would make it easier to attract more followers? Maybe a greater concentration on the environment would be more appealing to a wider audience. So if either of you would like to address that. I can take this one. Um, yeah, so there's, this is a very interesting question. Um, I'm in the public policy school at Michigan State. So this is something that I spend a lot of my, my day job ta uh, like thinking about and talking about. But um, I think that there's a difference between criticizing um, capitalism and a form of unfettered or crony capitalism that leads to um, crash after crash after crash in a, in a kind of gross concentration of wealth. Um, like our society has just changed. Um, in, in the late 1970s, um, the average CEO made 30 times more than the average worker, which you know is all well and good. Um, maybe that's a little bit more than you want, maybe that's less, but it's a fair amount, roughly. Now, that amount difference is, um, I believe in 2018, it was 278 times as much as the average worker. Um, unions have been under attack. There's just not a lot of protection for the average working person out there. Um, and so just like um, the New Deal was born um, out of out of a, a crisis, the, the Great Depression, that was an absolute collapse of capitalism after a lot of inside dealing for a very long time. Um, this is the Green New Deal is just saying that there are certain things that we shouldn't base off profit anymore. You know, we shouldn't base profit off of people getting sick off of imprisoning people because there still, there's still a system of private prisons here. It's just a vision for a world with um, a, where everyone has a chance to be socially mobile, to move up classes, to re, really, this is a plan to rebirth the American dream. That's what it is because um, I know my generation, I'm 20 and in my first 20 years, we've been at war all 20 and we've had the two of the three worst economic uh, crises in world history. Um, and there's just, there's a connection between not regulating the system enough and all of those things. Um, and so uh, your point is taken about, about um, kind of being blatantly critical of capitalism, but um, sometimes when a system isn't working, um, you, you have to talk about why it's not benefiting working people. Um, so yes, thank you for that question though, because it's a very important one. Um, also just to follow up kind of, sorry about that. Uh, like, so like, because um, like the movement like for um, Green New Deal is not just like one um, organization or like group of people who support it, um, like messages kind of like vary depending on who you're talking to. So like most presentations you see like about the Green New Deal will not have that uh, same focus. And like ours just did kind of because of like who was talking, you know, so um, yeah, that's all. Awesome, thank you both. So we have another question that came in and I feel like um, Judy can even speak to this question. Can you recommend books that, dis that discuss the Green New Deal in more detail? And as I stated earlier, we'll definitely provide the information. But Judy, if you want to touch on a few of the books that you've read regarding the GND. Okay, for some reason, my video isn't coming up, but I will. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, there are um, a, a new book out by the Sunrise Movement called Winning the Green New Deal. And it goes into huge detail on the history of the movement and then their policies and their ideas that they, they kind of have been summarized tonight. So I highly recommend um, this book and it can be, you can purchase it on um, 
Amazon or any one, any bookstore would have it. It's called Winning the Green New Deal, Why We Must, How We Can. Um, in fact, we're going to be raffling off two, uh, five copies of this book in just a few minutes. The other mm -hmm. book that I highly recommend is something called Climate of Hope, and it's by Michael Bloomberg and Carl Pope. So Michael Bloomberg uh, joined partners with the Sierra Club, and Carl Pope was the former national director at the time uh, of the Sierra Club. And they joined forces to really uh, address, first of all, to address um, uh, the whole issue with coal. And uh, with Bloomberg's support, financial support, they started um, basically helping communities move away from coal burning plants to other forms of uh, greener technologies. This is a really good book. His, their thesis is that uh, we should not look to the federal government, but we should look to local communities and at the state and county level to really start addressing these problems. And they feel, uh, particularly Michael Bloomberg, is that this can be, and uh, there are all the economic reasons why we need to move to green technologies. The other book that I recommend is called something called Climate Change. It's by Joseph Rome. It's what everyone needs to know. It's basically, it has a lot of, of, I would call scientific jargon, but they bring it down to a level that most lay people can understand. So this is my first book I read that kind of got me all pumped up to learn more. And um, so these are three books I would recommend. And we'll have that in our little handout sheet we're gonna send to everybody at the end of this, okay? Yes, thank you so much, Judy. And I hope that answered your question. So uh, feel free to throw any other questions in the Q&A. Um, so while we're waiting for folks to do that, I have a couple for you, for you uh, young men. And this one is, Dan, you were speaking during your presentation, you know, you showed us a chart that said 72% of Americans believe in and want to reduce the effects of climate change. So why is there so much controversy? And I feel like all of you touched on this, but if, if so many Americans are in support of it, why is there so much controversy around accepting this bill? Yeah, so um, like just kind of, um, so like I think like, like two angles to it, I guess. So one thing that uh, Robert uh, mentioned was kind of the decades long misinformation campaign, which uh, was done by the fossil fuel companies to try to uh, like stop any climate action to like sow doubt about uh, the science of uh, climate change. So that's like, I guess like a big picture reason why you see controversy. But as you said, most people have not like bought into that. Most people like do believe in climate change. So what happens is there's kind of like a, um, there's something lost in translation like between what most like people think and what politicians think, right? So you have a lot of like actors in politics, including like lobbyists and uh, and the corporate power, which hold a lot of sway in politics. Um, so like we can talk about like, all the tactics that like they use in terms of like funding campaigns. Uh, like lots of people are afraid that if they cross the fossil fuel lobby, uh, then they can face a well-funded like primary challenger. Um, uh, there's like really good research by somebody named Leah Stokes that shows that um, when politicians uh, like staff like meets more with fossil fuel um, or with lobbyists or like lobbyists who have previously worked for for fossil fuel um, companies, they underestimate how much public support uh, like exists for climate change. So like if you show that graph like to like a politician, they'd probably like be surprised. They'd say like people want climate action, right? Because they kind of like live in this world where they talk to like all these people who are trying to sway them like the opposite way. So that's kind of why mm -hmm. things get lost in translation. And so like, that's kind of like the job of like movements is to build the power that equals uh, like the power that, that those insiders have, you know? Yeah, I'll just add to that. Um, the two things that come to my mind are very split media ecosystems right now. Um, so people are getting their information from, there's no more one reliable trusted source. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, of media uh, 
sources where um, you're not hearing from scientists, you're hearing from people paid by the fossil fuel industry to deny science, um, which leads into my second half uh, for this problem, which is just follow the money. You know, like James Inhofe, for example, is a senator from Oklahoma. He infamously, um, 10 to 12 years ago now, brought a snowball into the floor of the US Senate and said it was proof that climate change does not exist, clearly not going past the fourth grade curriculum to know that weather and climate are different. But, um, you know, if you go and look at his campaign contributors, I guarantee you will find Murray, Murray Industries and Coke Industries and a whole lot of other um, energy companies just stacked one on the other. Awesome. Thank you very much. So it just sounds like there's different audiences that are supporting and opposing this, and that's the information that's out there. Okay. So another question for you all. I've heard some news outlets claim that the GND will ban all cows. What agricultural policies are being considered? <laughs> I can take that one real quick. So that line comes from um, Alex, uh, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's office. Uh, she's the representative who uh, worked with the movement to put this on the floor um, of, of the US Congress. And someone in her office made a joke on a memo that said, okay, what's the date we get rid of all the cows and airplanes by? And certain media companies ran wild with it. And it really hasn't gone away since then. Um, if anybody else wants to tackle like actual agricultural policy, then uh, go ahead. Um, I'm happy to speak on it. Like if you don't want to, Robert, but. Yeah, go for it. Cause I'm, I'm looking, I'm, asking, I'm looking at some of these other questions that I, I was getting kind of excited. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, so um, yeah, so some agricultural policies, um, which advocates like of the Green New Deal support, is basically working with farmers to move toward like regenerative and sustainable um, agricultural policies. So cows actually are a uh, major uh, like source of like carbon emissions, but um, that's like largely because of their diet. So like we have a bill that's in the country called the Farm Bill which offers major subsidies to corn and soy. Um, so that's why if you drive around Ohio, there's basically two kinds of crops you see, corn and soy. <laughs> so uh, that's called like monocropping where one farm just has one kind of uh, crop and it's not like environment, it's not uh, like environmentally uh, sustainable because you have to like supplement the soil with all these uh, different like fertilizers which are produced using uh, fossil fuels. And uh, like there's like a million other reasons why too. and um, that's also why uh, cows are mostly fed like corn products, which is not really what they're supposed to eat, which is in turn why they are a major source of like, carbon emissions. So uh, like a lot of the agricultural policies that you hear about is basically changing what is like subsidized. So, you, so like you could imagine like a situation where lots of different like edible vegetables are like subsidized, which would like create like an agricultural system that's more based on like growing like healthy food. And like that would also make farms kind of more like diverse in what foods they grow, um, and, uh, which would like move away from like from uh, the current like system of uh, monocropping. So that's just one policy. I'm like I'm not like an expert in this uh, uh, the area, so you know. Thank you for that. So there's another question that is really uh, parallel to the question that I had for you. Um, where is the, this is me, where is the Green New Deal in the current presidential campaign? And then we have a question from one of our attendees that says, do you know where Joe Biden and Kamala Harris stand regarding the Green New Deal? So I guess I'll take that one. From what I've seen recently, there's definitely a shine away from the Green New Deal, you know, like like um, even in the recent debates, they were um, they were getting pressure from Trump and Pence, um, all like almost in like an, an antagonizing way. Um, oh, you support the Green New Deal? That's bad for you know all the hysteria again, and this is bad. You know, just the lack of information. 
and you see um, Harris and Biden, you know, pretty much straight up say like, yeah, we don't support the Green New Deal, that, that, you know, that's too far, that's too radical, left, whatever. But if you rewind to the earlier in the campaign, even before um, Biden and Harris teamed up, um, they made it pretty much clear that they did support the Green New Deal, or at the very least supported aspects of it, the framework of it. But, but you, um, so for me, there's clearly um, a more of a, a rhetorical kind of war going on right now, because earlier on, especially when you have people like Bernie still in the race and Warren still in the race, a lot of the candidates, one, everyone almost across the aisle where they were more in the center and more progressive, wanted to show some sort of way how progressive they were. So, oh, we support the Green New Deal or something similar. But, you know, once the others had dropped out and it was just Biden, now you're seeing almost the opposite where they're trying to reel it in back towards the centers. Like, well, actually, I never said any of that. You know, that's too, you know, like it was almost at first, oh, I have to sound more progressive so I can beat out Sanders and the like. But now that Sanders out the picture, now I need to be more in the center so Trump doesn't play this hysteria like I'm trying to destroy America and all this kind of stuff, you know. So really, um, I think it goes back to the movement building and organizing. You know, that's what pressures people in the first place to support something. You know, for the, um, they're like even going back to FDR and Green New Deal, that came from decades of, of labor movement organizing to even get him to put anything on the table. So my point is, to answer your question, we saw that pressure work in the beginning of um, the, of the election, you saw a lot more of the candidates take a more progressive stance specifically towards climate change as part of the Green New Deal. So I think, um, unfortunately, they are backpedaling a little bit just because of the fear mongering that you're seeing from the other side of the aisle. So I think it just comes back to us getting more involved and staying more organized and building and, and continue to build that kind of momentum to keep them from swaying away from that, you know, stay the course and, and, and stay with it. So I hope that answers the question. I think so. So if I'm understanding correctly, you're saying that they showed support earlier and have been influenced to, to state otherwise recently. Exactly. It's like very, okay. it kind of swayed based on whatever influences were relevant at the time. Gotcha. Okay. Also, if it's okay, if I just add something. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so so like Robert like did a, like a really good job of laying out like the rhetorical changes that have happened. Um, so that is like one of the things that we have to like confront is kind of this idea that like politicians have that like in order to like win elections, they can't like talk about climate. Um, so like uh, behind the scenes, there's been like a second uh, kind of shift, uh, uh, which is that uh, the framework which I talked about called standards, investments, and justice, which has uh, like kind of like built a consensus around uh, like democratic uh, type like policymaking groups, um, has actually has uh, has actually like been adopted by the Biden campaign, um, mm -hmm. and so like you can imagine on like all three of those fronts in terms of standards that like a movement uh, like could push them to like, adopt more stringent uh, standards. A larger investments and like a stronger like commitment to justice, um, so they have so they have adopted that uh, the framework and so so Biden's the climate plan now is actually much stronger than it was in the primary, even though he wanted to seem in the primary like he was the climate candidate. Um, so there's kinds of these like two things happening like at once of this growing like consensus around the policy, um, and then like a desire to like try to like win an election and like not talk about it. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's like a big pressure that we'll have to face. Awesome. I'm learning so much here tonight. Um, Judy, did you have any questions that you wanted to ask our, our panelists? Um, well, or anything you to I think that, let's see if I can share my screen here. No. Um, I think, one of the things I, w I wanted to mention about um, the kind of political uh, temperament right now, I, I think that one of the things that the Sunrise Movement uh, is trying to bring to our attention is the lack of urgency around the issue of climate change. 
And what is my reason for wanting to be involved with having these community discussions about climate change? Um, I realized that I really didn't know a whole lot about what was happening. I became alarmed uh, by just you know, picking up a newspaper or watching the news in the evening, uh, the fires out in California, the flooding in the Midwest, the hurricanes in the South. It's just happening uh, really more frequently now. And I think uh, the one of the things that has really inspired me about the Sunrise Movement is the urgency uh, in which these young people have, have kind of put forth. They're saying, we have to do something now. And I think um, their, part of their strategy is this kind of grassroots organizing. And since the introduction of the Green New Deal, which was introduced to Congress back, I don't know, about a year ago, um, by uh, one um, Senator Markey and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez um, introduced it. Uh, there have been the the whole growth of the sunrise sunrise movement nationally has just grown exponentially. So I think more people are becoming aware, and I I think that's what these young people are saying is, look, wake up. We have to discuss this. We can't politicize this. This is going to affect all of us. I'm concerned about my son who is in his 30s. I'm concerned about someday having grandchildren who are going to inherit this climate. And I, I'm very concerned about our community here in Ohio City. How is this going to affect us? And so um, I think that's the one of the big, the big uh, questions. And you have to know the, that there are certain forces in this country that are there, what I call pure capitalism. They believe that you drive profit at the risk of everything else. And I think that that's unjust. I think we have to pull back a little bit now and really look at what it, what's happening to us. We have to make this fairer for everyone involved. Okay, that's my mantra. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. Very important point. I just wanted to get to the last couple of questions. We have a couple more minutes. So let me throw this out here. Exxon TV commercials give the impression that they support green initiatives, if not the GND. Is Exxon or any large corporation supportive of the GND? And I see you shaking your heads already. Yeah, that's not true. Um, <laughs> so the Exxon, uh, it was just like made uh, public their 10 year or 20 year plans for like their <clears throat> business model, and they only plan to expand fossil fuels. Um, so one, so like fossil fuel like companies are starting to make like a secondary like investment. Uh, like away from fossil fuels and it's into plastics uh, like because plastics are actually uh, like a demand of fossil fuel because they're made of natural gas so they're definitely not doing good stuff on climate um, and so they're running those ads to like trick people like I like hope I don't sound like I'm like a conspiracy theorist but this is all like public information <laughs> so uh, like don't buy into those ads and yeah um, so uh, many uh, fossil fuel companies are now supporting a carbon tax uh, because um, they uh, uh, like, like they think that they can just pay it. So like if there's like a tax on the carbon, then then um, then um, some large company like um, Exxon will just say like okay, they will pay it right, um, and then they can just like kind of like keep on keeping on. So it's kind of like where we're at. Um, they're fossil fuel companies, so they won't support the phase down of fossil fuels, and so we just have to be more powerful. Than them. Yeah, um, the, the, the fossil fuel companies are directly who we are fighting this campaign against. Um, they have spent decades and billions of dollars at this point on misinformation campaigns that would try to teach you that this plastic water bottle in my hand or the straw in your Starbucks in the morning is what's causing climate change when in fact in all of world history 100 corporations, including Exxon, are responsible for 71% of all carbon emissions ever. That is directly who we are fighting against. Wow, that's deep. So um, I think it's important that we 
provide the information in our follow-up that supports this, these statements, so that we can all do our own research and, you know, formulate our own opinions. So I'm not discounting at all what you're saying. These are just some big claims. <laughs> so I'm going to definitely do some reading, um, read the book. Judy, I, I bought the book that we're giving away tonight. So sure. I'll be reading that. Yes. Um, let's see, really quickly. I just signed up for the Sunrise Chapter University Circle, which is Case Western Reserve University. The application is totally geared towards students. Are these open to us? And she put in quotes, old folks. Thanks. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. I actually, um, I know in Cleveland, there's, like I said, I just, I just recently got involved myself. So I couldn't list like the whole roster of folks that are involved in the local hub. But I, I remember just um, participating in a couple of recent meetings and there's, it's, it's open to all ages. You, it'll be more than welcoming. It's a space that's um, there's definitely support and then centers all, all people of all ages. So it is, a, it is um, from what I've seen, definitely student oriented. There's definitely a lot of students involved, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's, it's student only. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Robert. It's, um, I mean, if we really think about it, some of the largest movements in the world have been run, have been, you know, pushed by, by young people, you know, teens, 20s, early 30s. That doesn't exclude anyone else from participating, but it's maybe that Case Western, the Sunrise Movement has, has set it up like this because we know that you all are the next generation and we need you all to help with this movement. Thanks everyone for being on the call. I think Judy has a couple of closing statements and some additional next steps. So I'll let her take it from here. Okay, well, I just wanted to um, thank everybody for um, dialing in, uh, however you did. Uh, I wanted to let you know that we have, this is one of a series of discussions we're gonna be having on climate change. The next one is gonna be, uh, in February, we're gonna take a break because the election's coming up and then it's the holidays and then it's the inauguration. We're all hoping it's gonna be uh, a hopeful time. So in February, we're going to regroup and we'll have a discussion uh, with a representative from the Sierra Club. And it's gonna be on the work that they're doing with Michael Bloomberg uh, and Carl Pope in shutting down coal plants across the country, but namely here in Ohio. And um, so I think that'll be a really interesting discussion to uh, how they're helping communities move away from coal to other forms of, of either it's natural gas or it's, it's other green technologies. So um, that will be coming up in February. Then in March, we're hoping to have someone from the city uh, department on sustainability, Jason Wood. Uh, we're still negotiating that and then the following month in April would be someone from the county, Mike Foley and his department on sustainability to find out what the county is doing. The idea is to give everyone a, a, in Ohio City, which is our primary focus, but anyone's willing, you know, we're open to anyone being part of the discussion, is to kind of get ourselves uh, educated about what's happening around us. And um, we'll be pu pushing out this uh, follow-up information sheet with some of these books and journals that we mentioned. And I encourage all of you to start reading and to start asking a lot of questions. And, and if you can sign up for a discussion or a webinar or something, but we all need to start educating ourselves. So, and I also wanna just give uh, a call out to the community of St. Peter for helping They've been very supportive of me in this effort. I went to them with this idea and I said, you know, I'd like to do this. I'd like to start first in our, uh, in the community where I live. And um, because I think this is something we all need to be uh, really, it's, it's part of our of social justice. This is something that's going to affect everyone. It doesn't matter your social economic status, your ethnicity, it doesn't matter where you're from, it's gonna affect all of us. So it's a, we need to get going folks. Mm -hmm. And I just awesome. wanna also mention that uh, the community of St. Peter will also be sponsoring these other discussions along with Ohio City Inc. So 
this is just the beginning. Okay. Thank you so much, Judy. That was perfect. What a great way to end the call and the presentation. Dan, Troy, and Robert, thank you so much for taking the time out to share this important information with us. And thank you, all of the attendees, for participating tonight.